Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and this video is going to be an overview on the latest letter from the producer live. What is this one? 73, 74? One of the two. I think it's live letter number 73 we got going on here. This was the first thing after the introduction that happened during the 14-hour broadcast celebrating the years and years of the game being around. Normally, that broadcast is closer to the anniversary of A Realm Reborn, but... That's just not how things have been for the last several years. So that's how it is. Largely, there's not a lot to talk about. The topics that are in here that they do touch upon are ones we could almost make standalone videos about instead of a live letter overview. But it's really just a recap of patch 6.2, reviewing some of the contents there and talking about the development of them. And a little preview again of 6.25, not much because we've already seen a lot from the last live letter. And then the entire back half is an interview with several members of the scenario team. And so that's more technical information. It's not really announcements that affect you and me, but it did end with something very, very, very exciting. Also, we got to see Fox Clon as a Loprit. And uh, yeah, I just want that burned into your retinas. So in case you didn't see it, uh, he does this every 14 hour broadcast. He dresses up in makeup of a character, whether it be a beaver, a loperet, or a sin eater. <laughs> and it's horrifying every time, but he seems to really enjoy it. So uh, I'm gonna keep encouraging him to go about that. Before we go any further, Thank you to the unofficial translation that came out of the Final Fantasy XIV subreddit. Uh, all of this is not official statements from Square Enix, and thus always take it with a grain of salt. We will probably get an official digest in the next week or two, but odds are that most of this information is pretty close to correct. So thank you to Miyuna and Iluna Minori, as per usual. And there's, of course, a link in the description for taking you to the Reddit Discord. Uh, speaking of which, Miuna, it's 6.20 a.m. and I'm on zero hours of sleep. It's uh, midnight for me right now, and I am running on about four hours of sleep. So I want to get this video done ASAP. So let's get started. Oh, I guess I didn't need to scroll up because here this is right here. Uh, so first they just say, hey, we're going to be reviewing patch 6.2 and 6.25 stuff. Um, they said that other than the Savage tier being uh, overtuned, that the patch they felt went pretty smoothly. Sorry for that. <laughs> Sorry for the P8S thing. Yeah, I thought they were going to spend more time talking about that, but they really didn't. First thing they did was they went over Storm's Crown, Barbaricha. All they basically said was uh, the reason they didn't tell us that it was going to be Barbaricha prior to the patch is that they knew everyone kind of had that expectation of what the order of the fiends was going to be because of Final Fantasy IV. So they figured, you know, when you're doing MSQ, one of the fun parts of it is getting to a point and trying to figure out how they're going to incorporate previous Final Fantasy characters into the story. So when they can throw us a curveball here and again, break expectation, really surprise everyone, it's something they want to be able to do. So keeping her a secret was just in the best interest of the team. They also talked about the fight design, about how they didn't want anything that was too puzzly. They just wanted a very fast paced, high tempo encounter. And they felt like they achieved that pretty well. So overall, that's all they really had to say about Storm's Crown. And I was a big fan of it. So I'm glad that they decided to go that way. They even talked a little bit about the development of the circle when you're tied together to another player with the hair um, to indicate when you've gone too far. They said that was actually pretty troublesome to design that properly um, and to make it clear to the player. But I felt like they did a good job. So, you know, not much to say about that. Uh, Pandemonium, they just talked about how, uh, they just talked about La Habrea a little bit, how they had enough time in order to actually add voice lines and how they were really excited to dive into La Habrea as a character a little bit more. Um, and other than that, they didn't really say too much. They just said that they've been improving on, you know, working on things like that, like adding the voices to the encounters and working with the arena to do a few more fun things. The most important thing that came out of this was them addressing feedback regarding the one week delay of Savage. And they said that the feedback has been very positive and that right now they're leaning towards keeping the one week delay, probably with a few more adjustments, however. Um, the big thing that they really notice, and I really noticed this too, people were concerned that crafted gear was not going to have a good market in the patch, but what actually ended up happening is because day one, it didn't really flood the market. There were some people that kind of worked on it the day it came out to make some money and people who just gradually kind of worked on it over the week, the market value of crafted gear actually was way more stable and more profitable than I think I've seen it for most players on a patch day, then I, it's just, it's been a long time because we had a week 
to get the crafted gear before the raid actually came out. And everyone thought that, oh, you know, all the hardcore uh, raiders aren't going to be buying it all up and there's not going to be all these commissions and everything. Um, but it just meant more people got to, you know, dip into it. The hardcore people who normally craft day one and go nuts didn't really do it as much. And I feel like everyone kind of just had a better time with the market, except for that, like, 1% of crafters that, like, specifically is commissioned for raid teams. They're the only people who didn't have a good time with this. So I was really impressed that it actually went that way. I, I didn't see that coming at all. But it looks like we're going to get to keep that one-week delay on Savage. Now, job adjustments. They didn't go into anything in particular. We know Paladin is getting a rework in 6.3 because it is clearly stated on the job guide for Paladin. Or even on, I think it might be on the tank page on the job guide on the Lodestone. But they said they've been getting a lot of feedback about jobs. Uh, and also they're explaining the actual explanation of them. So uh, they want to go into more detail with those explanations in the future because they felt like their explanations were kind of um, insufficient or taken out of context. And they just want to make sure there's more clarity there. So the big thing is that we got out of this. We are going to be getting some number adjustments in 6.25, which is confirmed for October 18th. They confirmed that later in the same live letter. And a few more in 6.28, which is actually confirmed for November 1st, also later in this live letter. Now, those are only number adjustments. They're not going to be making any major changes to the jobs or how they work. Like I said, Paladin rework is in 6.3. But the big thing they address here is the reason they are making those adjustments to jobs in 6.25 and 2.8 is because of the increase to the hitbox size for melees. Now, previously, we knew that they had designed some jobs around their mobility and their ability to hit the bosses from any range. Us players call that the ranged tax. Now, they are admitting here that because the hitboxes are so big that the balance between ranged and melee is off. So that's where the, the number adjustments are going to happen. People like to debate if it's going to be nerfs to the melee because of the hitbox or buffs to the range. The team has classically shown that they would rather buff weaker jobs than nerf powerful jobs unless a job is in a troubled state. Honestly, the only melee I could ever see them nerfing based on current balance is Monk. I think it is too powerful on average. And I, I, as much as I'm playing it right now, it was just the only melee I could possibly see them nerfing. I'd be surprised if any other ones got them. But I read this more as a ranged buff, you know, bring the ranged up. So that's what I'm hoping the result is. But I'm glad to see they've A, acknowledged that the range tax doesn't make sense anymore. And B, are addressing it with number related changes soon. I don't think that's going to fix certain things, but... It is what it is. They are going to be doing action adjustments in 6.3, though. Probably not just for Paladin, but for other jobs as well. Uh, for PvP, there's going to be some job adjustments in 0.28. And cover is going to get changed in 0.25. There's a big problem with Paladin cover and Onsal Hakar, where it almost makes the games unwinnable as long as you have enough Paladins to just chain cover people while they're actually capturing the point. So whether or not that's going to have a major impact on Crystalline Conflict, we need to wait and see. It's, uh, you never know. So uh, that's 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 all there is to it. Island Sanctuary, they said they are making some plans based on feedback. They want people to take their time and enjoy this over time, but they notice that a lot of people, especially in Japan, take it super seriously. They min-max it, and they just try to optimize the entire thing. Uh, players also feel pressure when they see an empty schedule in the workshop. But that's, again, in Japan, people are, like, super optimizing it and playing every day. They said in the West, the average player logs in every other day, so they don't really mind missing things on occasion. However, the big thing they address is that players want more customization for their island. He said he knew this would happen. Players want, like, furnishings or they want more things just to make their individual island stand out. They said some of those things are very difficult to implement. However, they are currently working on the ability to place, and I'm going to quote the unofficial translation here, garden housing items on their island. They don't have a release schedule for that feature yet, but they are trying. Now, I think the unofficial translation says garden housing items. I assume it just means outdoor housing items. So anything that you would place outside of the house and none of the indoor furnishings. Um, there are a lot of people who have been asking for that exact thing, outdoor furnishings on the island. So there, that might increase the market value of those things when we get an official date on that, because that's people really, really, really want that. People also want actual gardening and not 
Island Sanctuary gardening. But this is this is a good thing. People want this, and if they get it incorporated sooner rather than later, then that's going to go over well with most of the community. They also talk about fashion accessories and how they share system memory with emotes, and that's why you can't do them at the same time. I'm assuming that's spaghetti code explanation. Basically saying that the way the system was built, there's no way to do fashion accessories without doing that. Um, they don't say that explicitly, but that's kind of how it reads. But they say they're trying to improve fashion accessories so that, you know, you have more options with them. You know, wearing a pair of sunglasses doesn't suddenly mean you can't use an emote, which I think they know is a little weird. Yeah, it's a little weird, you know. Um, they also talked about the Titania weapons, the crafted ones, and how much flashier they are, but that players are demanding more and more flashy stuff. On top of some players asking for more flashy equipment, there are other players asking for them to disable weapon and gear effects. Now, he says it's not that simple. What I'd assume the problem is is that their items are compacted into either one or two layers, the base layer, and then if available, a dieable layer which is actually probably just a skin over the original things. They probably have gone into this in more detail. What that means is that the effects are probably not on a separate layer. They probably go they probably go through an if and check, you know, if sheathed, if unsheathed, something simple like that. But there's no way to isolate it as a layer and turn it off. So they actually said this is something they're talking about for the graphics update for 7.0. It'll allow them to go even further with the designs and keep improving, but that they are, of course, a, a taking into account that whole disable weapon and gear effects problem. And keep in mind, it's not people wanting to turn off their own gear and weapon effects. It's wanting to turn off other people's because they're too flashy and too in their face. So uh, they are just... They just a, address a few things here they also say that some people want them to be able to die every individual piece of gear uh and that that's very tough like every individual aspect like oh die layer one die layer two die layer three he's like oh, i remember when people were just happy they could die things and it's just there's always another step it is just when's the next thing when's the next step yeah i mean that's the natural evolution they knew we knew and they knew that we knew and we knew that they knew so what are you gonna do so then they move on to talking about 6.25 very briefly. Again, 18th of October is going to be the release for that. And that is going to have Hildebrand, Relic Weapon, which is the Manderville Weapon in this case, the Omicron Tribal Quest, which are a Gathering Tribal Quest, Variant Dungeons, and Criterion Dungeons. We also get a little screenshot of this. Looks like, again, we know that a lot of, well, pretty much all of the Lost Races from the Final Dungeon are going to be present in the Omicron Quest line. So it looks like, uh, I, I'm really bad at remembering the names. There were the, the people who birthed the final boss, like the final section. I'd assume that's what all the foliage here is from. It's from that final section of the final day's dungeon. And the rest of that is from the, uh, what was the second people called? Not the Federation, not the, mm, I can't remember. I can't remember the name. It's it's like midnight and it just won't come to me. Uh, but it's like elements of those different civilizations are present in this image. So uh, it's going to be dealing with a lot more than just the Omicrons. But the, you know, the bar at the end of the universe... You know, that's uh, that's still the basis of the whole thing. We also saw that we're getting these, these like Blues Brothers style outfits. I'd assume these are from the Tribal Quests, if I had to guess. So uh, pretty good look. Pretty good look. I like it. I like it. Uh, we also got confirmation on the NA Data Center expansion. It was delayed a few months back. We were told it was delayed until the fall at some point. And it's confirmed that November 1st, along with patch 6.28, uh, we will be getting the new North American data center called Dynamis. And along with it will be four new servers, Halicarnassus, Maduin, Merilith, and Seraph. And so just four brand new worlds for North America for more people to populate. On top of that, the housing lottery for those new servers will open just four days after those servers come into existence. So for those of you looking to get a house, if you don't mind uh, shipping yourself off to another data center, hey, we have data center travel. Yeah, always something to remember. Worth considering. Uh, they're also working on adding more plots. That's, of course, across all of housing, all of the servers. But they haven't finalized the schedule on that yet. Um, there's also the chance that that patch on the November 1st will probably be a 24-hour patch. But they're not 100% sure yet. Now, for the second half of this, again, it's not that it's not interesting. But it's kind of... you. I feel like you'd rather read it on your own than have me read all the details, all the slides. They, they basically break down the career paths of several different members of the team 
Uh, they have uh, Daichi Hiroi, who is uh, probably the, I don't want to say the least known of the three people on this panel or on this section, but I think he's the one that was uh, the biggest anomaly. Like people were like, oh, I know the, I know Banri Oda and I know Ishikawa, but who's this guy? And so he had his time to kind of enter and explain what he does and how he fits onto the team and what his place is on the team. But then of course, Ishikawa and Oda-san, they both, uh, they both just went over, you know, their history, their responsibilities, talking about how they really don't write much story-wise anymore. It's they oversee people who do the writing, and then they, you know, have a major say in all of that. And we know that Koji is uh, the localization lead for all of Creative Business Unit 3, so that means he would also be tasked with stuff like Final Fantasy 16. So he's probably, you know, he's just at the very top. For me, the most exciting thing... Odasan is currently working on the third encyclopedia, Aorzia. He even shows us this brief image of the cover. There's nothing inside of it yet, but only the Japanese text is close to being done. All that needs to be translated to English as well, because they want to release the Japanese and the English ones at the same time. So it's still going to be a while away. That's going to tie in with some news that they cover pretty shortly after this. But yeah, and then again, now they start going through. Essentially, the rest of this is workflow for their develop for the the scenario writing team. It's like you know, it goes through this team and it goes through that team. And you know, for example, with the roll quests, we started with this idea and then we went to that. And it, it's just it's a lot of just workplace workflow. So I, again, I don't really want to cover this all too much. There's a picture from uh, they actually do these things for the scenario team. Uh, they do a boot camp over a weekend where they all basically just like get hotel like a hotel room and they just sit in it for like three days and they basically cover all the most major details they need to make sure that they really hammer down for story stuff for the next expansion we actually know they've already done this boot camp for 7.0 they did it sometime in the last couple of months <coughs> excuse me but this is a screenshot from then with the nutkins blocking out the important details of course as they do yeah they even talk about how the uh the role quests in Shadowbringers were largely inspired by the Archangels from Final Fantasy XI. Anyone who played XI probably isn't surprised by that. I know I thought it when I was doing it anyway. So, especially because they're named after the Cardinal Virtues. And uh, these are named after sins, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if memory serves. Well, they all represent a flaw in each of the major races in Final Fantasy XI. So, less of a sin. And, you know, it's like, you know, apathy and avarice and and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and greed and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's a little sin related, but they, it, they don't present it as that nearly as much as they just present it as flaws in the individual races. Uh, let's see. And then they just go down and then it's all workflow, workflow, workflow. That's all it is. <laughs> Otisan talking about how nobody wanted to write the healer role quests in Shadowbringer. So he did it himself and they turned out really good. So can't say I really fault him for that. And then they briefly touched upon Pandemonium, really tried to avoid saying much because it's not finished yet. They said that family was a key word, so Dom was clearly a, a part of this as well, talking about his relationship with Themis and his son. So, and then all the individual bosses and how the, the scenario team and the battle team and, you know, the music team all have to coordinate on all of these things to make sure that they're all great. And then they were done. Uh, they did have to say they are hiring in several positions. They're hiring... Scenario writers, game content designers, uh, live system designers, marketing planners, environmental artists, uh, VFX artists, and UI artists, and graphic engineers for console and PC. They are pretty much always hiring, so none of this is a surprise. Because the team is always trying to grow and always trying to hire more talent. They don't even, they're not even looking for people that are fluent, uh, that are uh, game developers. They're looking for people who are fluent and excellent in written Japanese that they can teach game development aspects, that they can like incorporate into their game development workflow. So uh, yeah, if you're fluent in uh, and excellent in written Japanese, then, uh, you know, go apply. There's, there's QR codes for pretty much all of these in the Discord. Now, the big thing, we have a big announcement. FanFest is back, they, and they will be in physical locations this time. Las Vegas for North America, London for Europe and Japan. They said they haven't been able to nail down a time or a place, but this actually tells us a lot. So first of all, July 28th and 29th for North America, that should be about probably nine or 10 weeks, I think, after patch 6.4. 
So we're going to be getting an expansion announcement there. FanFest only exists as a as a whole to provide us with uh, expansion information. Yes, it also acts as a, acts as a community event, but it is it only its core purpose is marketing for the expansion. So we're also probably going to get a live letter for patch 6.5 here. The 10 week marks a little early, like maybe just like two or three weeks early, but almost certainly they're going to cover 0.5 stuff in that. And then we'll have a part two live letter probably, you know, seven and a half weeks after that. Um, then for uh, Europe, probably going to be uh by then, 0.5 will be out, so they might preview 0.55 stuff in the live letter, but that's going to, again, be a little bit more detail in the expansion, and Japan will be the grand finale. Everything they haven't said about the expansion up to that point, they'll pretty much cover in Japan. We'll see the full trailer in Japan. We'll get teaser trailers in the other two. And yes, I am planning on going to at least the North American one. I would love to go to all three. I've never been to the European one. I've never even been to Europe, but I won't make that promise now. You know, it's, it's a year out, so... You never know what will happen in a year. Um, they also showed us the design contest winners. These will be incorporated in-game for Reaper and Sage weapons. We had the serious category, which was, you know, that's this is for weapons that people want to be badass and awesome. And then there's the joke category, which actually also looks badass for Reaper. And it's the scarecrow with a little lantern that lights up when the when battle mode is on, when your weapon is, is unsheathed. For Sage, this is by far my favorite. Uh, Feo Ol's Nulith, and this is, uh, the, you know, these are the Nulith, and when they're out of combat, they'll be on your back like wings, and they look really cool. I really like this idea and the use of the Sage weapon as a design almost for like a cape. In this case, it's for wings, but that's easily my favorite of the four designs. And then for the joke design, it's made brim cutlery set. <laughs> Literally going to have forks and knives and spoons, going to spoon your enemies to death. And these are going to be incorporated in-game as the grand prize winners, so keep an eye out for those. They also announced some more furnishing design contest winners. You can see a few screenshots there of some indoor and outdoor furnishings. So those are going to be cool as well. They issued a correction on the shawl, the Amarot shawl that they're selling. It's actually not made of 50% cotton. It's made of 50% rayon, which is a synthetic cotton in China. So that's just a little correction they felt they needed to make. EP2 for Endwalker is already out. I saw this earlier today before the announcement. And on top of that, we're going to be getting the lyrics to scream within a week on the Lodestone. So if you've been looking forward to that, that's another thing that you might enjoy. The vinyl for the Endwalker LP is here, of course, with the wonderful art on the front. It will release on dis uh, Saturday, December 3rd, and it includes a download co code of all the songs in MP3 format. The Orchestra Arrangement Volume 3 will go on sale Wednesday, December 7th, and is from the upcoming uh, Final Fantasy XIV Orchestra Concert 2022, Eorzean Symphony, recently announced for Japan. It'll also come with a cup sleeve as a pre-order bonus, but that design is not finalized yet, so they did not show it. All Saints Week, the seasonal event, is on time this year. While we had one back in January to cover 2011, uh, I almost said 2011, 2021's Halloween that we missed the event for because they were focused on the Endwalker launch. This one is on time this year. October 19th will be All Saints Week for 2022. Uh, then closing words, just they were happy that they got to be a part of this. They got to say what they wanted to say. Please sign up for our jobs. We are so desperate. We need to hire you. Just please speak, flu speak fluent and excellent and written Japanese, and you should be fine. Uh, and then also, Yoshi P just says that he really liked this more relaxed patch review, and he kind of wants to do these more in the future. Um, it looks like the translators are also covering the quiz time for the music. There, It is part of a 14-hour stream, so not all stuff is part of the live letter. But I'm not going to be covering that right now. So... That is it for the live letter overview. Not a whole lot of importance was said, but you know me, I like to stretch on a video while I, t while I speak my mind. And it's still a few things, just not much of it is very important. So it is already past midnight at this point. I can barely speak. I'm ready to cough my lungs out from all the talking I've done today. And I would like to get some damn sleep. So thank you everyone for watching this video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share. And keep an eye out for some more fun stuff hitting the channel in the next week. I'm really excited to be releasing a few videos on a few topics that I think some of you will enjoy that are just tangential to, to RPGs and whatnot. Just a little teaser. Anyway, with that, I'll see you in the next video. And until then, take care.